Uh, my name is Albert, and I'm also a graduate student at Bionics. UCF. Um, and we PenguinCon work, 2015. Um, in aerospace, and then we also now do these bionic arms. Um, and so, kind of our story over the last year of falling into this field of biomedical engineering and um, making a little bit of a splash. Um, and so we have found that kids really like to stand out, and they love superheroes, and they enjoy Blue Man Group and things like that. And so, we're trying to combine art and um, additive manufacturing and biomedical engineering. Packages all together to uh, give kids uh, a little bit of a better, um, a better option than they might currently have. Hi, uh, my name is Cindy Chestick. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. I'm in uh, bio biomedical engineering, um, also electrical engineering, robotics, and neuroscience. And so, uh, my job is to try to find ways of controlling prosthetic limbs using signals from the nervous system.
this is a little bit of our story um, where we, as college students, uh, saw a need in our community um, and were inspired by Ivan and his story. And we have scratched the very beginning of the surface of um, this little cost idea that bionics should be completely free to families um, around the world. Um, and so we took a step back from the um, extreme cutting edge medicine that I guess you're working on, which is like, you know, out of our reach right now, um, but really inspiring. And we've been able to kind of distill that down and say for right now, maybe we can make this work while um, doctors like Cynthia are, are trying to make um, the next 20 years worth of science uh, ready for kids. And so kids are usually like the last frontier because it's, it's really hard to work with kids um, ethically. There's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of challenges even with they, they grow and they, their learning curve has things have to work right away or they will reject it. Um, and so we're trying to be a temporary solution um, for the day that comes soon where we can fix all of these challenges um, as, as easy as possible. And, and to, add, to add a little bit to that too, one of the things that um, if, if a kid gets started using uh, a device now, it can help them to be ready to use the next generation of devices that will be available by the time that they're an adult. So that's um, that's part of part of the benefit, I, I, I would think. Um, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to hear more about the state of the art. Actually, uh, if you could fill us in in detail about um, like the the the, the, uh, the Deca arm and the various. Yeah, so, so I know less about the arms but than the neural control. They do have, there's a series of, you know, these very advanced prosthetic arms, like the APL arm, the DECA arm, um, the touch limb, the island, the touch bionics island. Um, there's a lot of actually these fully articulated limbs. Um, they're incredibly expensive. Like, uh, our, my last lab, we tried to buy a DECA arm, and it's like, they quoted us $400,000 for, you know, that, and it's still mostly a research system, so, you know, they're trying to get it down to $100,000, and so it's, it's very, and you can buy an island commercially for 50000 So that's, that's sort of the state of the art, is that they can, you know, they can do a lot. They can give you all the articulated finger motions. They can do a lot of the internal hand movements. There are sensors in the fingers, but it's $100,000 of them. Um, the state of the art is, is you know, uh, to my knowledge, in terms of the neural control, uh, is something called targeted muscle reinnervation, which is where you know you can record a lot of signals through the skin, but you can't get all of them. And you can, usually, people just have an open and a close that they're using. Um, so it's it's a way of moving the the nerves around to make that signal better, and so you can maybe get more independent signals. And I've seen you know three or four movements out of one of those. Um, in terms of stuff that's just barely starting human trials, um, there's devices for recording from nerves, so you can record, you know, actual single axons, um, and there's implantable systems for EMG. And so this is just there's a couple of people um, that have had these, um, the IMEs, uh, they're these little sort of, you know, yay big. Uh, size implants to record EMG, and there's a couple of people uh, working on implantable EMG systems that can record from lots of different areas at the same time. So, so there's a lot of stuff coming, but you know, um, it's it's a very very slow process. So, so are all of your users are they are they myoelectric users before you talk to them, or is this the first time they're using a myoelectric limb? First time they're using a myoelectric limb. Okay. Does it work on the first try, or do they need to practice? Uh, so a little bit both. A little okay. bit both. Yeah. Most <laughs> yeah. of the time, they can put it on, and it actually worked. But then, okay. a lot, uh, so the more they use, it, the better they get. Yeah. 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 Okay. I was going to comment on that. That I've seen a couple of these videos now. This one, and, and I saw the Iron Man one was awesome. Um, and uh, it looks like the kids they put the arms on, and they like immediately are able to open and close on, move them around. Like how so we we do a, a test run. Not with the arm, but with the technology. So we um, we found it was really important for kids that they get to touch everything. And so we have a please touch lab essentially, and we bring them in. We show them the printers, we show them the electronics, we show them the arms, um, and we say here's all the parts, and they look through it. And kids are so inquisitive and they want to see everything. We have them turn it on, and then we'll just have this on the table. And our electrodes are currently in the mail to be here, but. Um, they'll be here tomorrow so we can do some more demos, but essentially with headphones you can, you can kind of do this too, but um, we stick them with the little, our, all of ours is surface EMG, so it's not invasive, um, 
and that's really important for kids too because they need to be able to take it off and just be a kid. Um, and so we hook the two up on their, their lowest muscle on their limb that's terminated um, and then one ground usually on the back so we have a, a difference in the muscle groups and we just say okay so flex and, and they, if they can see what happens it works. Now with Alex when we started testing this last year our very first project um, he was able to pick it up within a minute or two, yeah. just on a table. And then when he picked up the arm, he could use it within you know, 15 minutes. And within 45 minutes, he could throw a ball underhand, which is a very complex neuroplasticity effect. Um, and so he was actually able to, in his mind, say, okay, so when I, when I flinch my bicep on this muscle that I've never used before, that we could tell, he never really used it. Never used it. And if I tell my body, I want to release that flinch so that the ball will come out at the apex of me going like this. And he did it on the first try. And so with a six-year-old, you can do that. With an adult, we're not sure if that's actually possible. And our medicine school now wants to study this neuroplasticity effect that EMG with children may actually unlock secrets that can help adults learn too. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, uh, how, how, I was actually I was going to ask how successful the I've heard it called the uh, nerve reassignment surgery, or, you know, where they where they put like the pads on your back or, or different muscle groups, unused muscle groups, where they reassign the. Or, I don't know if it's just a theory so or if they've actually tested that. Yeah. Okay. So are you? So I think that is targeted muscle reintegration. Is that uh, what you? Yeah. Mean? I, I, yeah. I, it sounds a similar thing. I just. Yeah. That's well, that's. Gotta, I I did this uh, ten years ago. Okay. Like when they were, this was way in its infancy theory. There, I think there there have been now dozens of people with TMR. So that's that's gone pretty well. And to, to my that knowledge, that's in the internals. The yeah. So implants. so you have to, no that that TMR is not implants. Um, yeah. It it may be at the limit of what it can do without an implant at this point. So they move um, so they move the nerves around and they put them usually in chest muscles. Yeah. Um, and then you can actually do a really good job if you have like really high density gel electrodes on the chest. You can yeah. detect like 16 different movements. You can't do that <laughs> like in normal usage. So then they do dry EMG electrodes in the socket and that's where they get down to sort of like three or four movements. And so that's might be as good as it gets unless there's some breakthrough in the algorithm. Is it a safe analogy to compare it to cable splicing? So because you essentially you have signal cables, you're taking them and you're splicing them into the cables that terminate in the pectoral muscles, for instance, or? Yeah, okay. I'm not sure. I don't think they splice a lot of TMR. They hope for splicing. Oh, okay. Like they put the nerve in and like sometimes it divides out and sometimes it doesn't. But like, yeah, so um, in my lab, what we're working on is we're trying to actively like the surgeon splices. And, uh, and then you sort of put each nerve in a different piece of muscle and then you have sort of more division and it's like you'll start with. Surgeons are very good at this. <laughs> it's incredibly scary for us. As mechanical and aerospace engineers, that side of biomedical is a little bit terrifying. Like, uh, how you can go in there and do that. Uh, it's, it's fun to watch surgeons do their thing, like if they let you go in the OR and see. So. We're thrilled uh, on the engineering side that engineering and medicine are finally talking to each other. This for the first you know, hundreds of years, yeah. <laughs> it was best practices, and they were very much separate. And so we're seeing simulation and modeling um, now finally play a role. And there's some professors at our university as well that are doing this. Um, and I think in the next 20 years, we're supposed to see some huge breakthroughs in biomedical engineering. And we're hoping to finish our degrees and get on board with that too. Well, one of the main things that's starting to take place in, in, in uh, the university setting as well is that there's a, a, um, starting to be pockets in different places in the country and the world where there's a huge push towards interdisciplinary studies. So, you know, at, 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 back in Washington State, um, the University of Washington is the only university doing it there. There's, a, there's an interest now in forming student teams for doing research where, the, where it com combines, you know, for instance, uh, a med student, a, a, software, a software engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and maybe even somebody that's um, from psychology. So the, the, they're looking at forming these teams to, to more holistically approach problem solving, particularly in the medical sector, because of the, the overlap that exists between all those disciplines within the medical space. Good question? Yeah, I was um, what rate is the technology growing? Like, if we just saw it given to the, uh, to the kid, what will that be essentially obsolete and better technology? And, and how do you deal with that? Are you three getting deep printing the arms? And letting them grow into them, and, and you know, how modular are these to allow the, the you know the software to be upgraded and the technology to be upgraded? So um, that arm 
is about eight months in the making for our team. We started in last summer, and the first arm that we prototype we built was the size of an adult male calf. It was huge. So just to shrink everything down and get it to be this big, took us six months. To get it to work really well, it took about eight months. Um, and it's already obsolete. So it's, it's obsolete based on what other people in the field have. We have kind of a targeted niche because um, for kids they grow, like you said, and we can do things extremely modular, and this doesn't really change. Um, we can upgrade the finger lengths if we need to, but in reality, uh, how much does a child's hand change between age six and age 12? And the answer is about that much. So from a mechanical perspective, we're like, wow, okay, um, we can make a couple more, we can change out the finger length, and we can keep your palm size pretty similar, um, scaled up a little bit, and it's really easy to do that with a 3D printer, right? I can reprint just the palm piece for $10, $5, depending on my quality of the printer and the expense of the proprietary uh, nature of the printer company. Um, and so it's definitely obsolete because they do make $100,000 arms. But those $100,000 arms aren't able to reach down into the demographic of kids. And, and so this has really found a unique opportunity to give open access as a temporary device to get them to when they're 18 and they can go for the full insurance covered $100,000 or million dollar arms. What did that arm cost? What would like the street value of that arm be for, for the that you guys did? Uh, less than $300 in materials. Right. So not including the engineering. Plus the know-how and all the other stuff. Like, if, if, if a company was going to charge that arm, what would they Well, we're hoping a, there will never be a company that charges for it. We're going to empower communities through universities and academics <coughs> so that we can help all these kids um, independent of, uh, of a corporation having to charge you know, $50,000. And we think that there's a great opportunity that communities will be willing to rally around the kids that they know that grew up down the street and we're trying to just you know fit in and then help them really be able to stand out. So that's our hope is that uh, people like you and uh, doctors and universities will be there to kind of step in for that. Oh, I was gonna say, um, there's an interesting situation going right now. Um, so how many people in this room know there's a visual prosthesis? Okay, so you've heard of it? Yes, and so it's really interesting to, we're, we're watching that very closely because it's kind of like, the vanguard for these other very expensive technologies and whether they're really going to be reimbursed by insurance. So the system costs one hundred fifty thousand dollars right now, and it gives people, you know, blind people, a couple of good pixels, which is, you know, very very helpful if you want. Um, and so, you know, they're trying to see if it'll be interesting to see if insurance will reimburse it. Um, but right now, they're just selling to blind members of the Saudi royal family. You know, it's very like it, you're, the, the business will not take off and will not be sustainable until they can get insurance companies to pay for it. And so, we'll see what happens. And, and the other end of the spectrum. Um, so, I think really what's what's interesting as as far as near term, near near term, let, let's say next uh, five to ten years in in, in bionic and bio, bionic prosthetic technology, what we're going to see is not necessarily. Uh, uh, a huge shift in the, the, the state of the art is going to continue to evolve. But what's going to have the most impact in the near term is level of access to knowledge on how to produce these systems. So one of the things that's being worked on actively by by, by various entities, you know, um, and, and and researchers, etc., is the the technology for bioelectric control, for instance, has exist existed long enough that the initial patents have expired. So the question now is, how do we hack that? Figure out how to produce it in, a, in, a, in an easier way. Make that that new that new code that results, for instance, for driving an Arduino or for driving another uh, microcontroller. Make that code open source and accessible, and then and then people can produce these in many locations without there being an, um, an inhibitor of intellectual property in the process. So um, and that's all. That's what's already starting to take shape. Um, you know, it's it's been taking shape for for body powered uh, printed devices for about. Um, for about a year and a half now, which has resulted in uh, over 1,200 body power printed uh, upper extremity devices being delivered to people free of charge. Um, so, you know, and it's, and it's growing from there. And now we have individuals looking at, okay, how do we take a higher tech system, hack that? You know, I always like to point out the hand that's on the end of that is essentially a Victorian era prosthesis. It's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a cable and pulley mechanism that closes the hand. You know, but back in the Victorian era, that would have been extremely difficult to produce. 
It would have been, you know, the knowledge required, the time it takes to carve it out of a block of wood or something like that, you know, it wasn't scalable back then. Um, and, and so a team that wants to work on the electrical control doesn't have to design the hand portion because that was already, you know, out there in the open source world. Um, once they build their part, if somebody else wants to explore and, and add to what they, you know, what they're doing, that then exists and somebody can go, oh cool, here's all this, I'm going to add this, this, and this to it. Um, the benefit of modular collaboration. Modular collaboration. So I think, I think that's, that's what's really new about, uh, about what's happening with, with this kind of technology presently. Yeah, this modular collaboration is something that can happen, like, not only in universities, but like hackerspaces. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we just signed on the University of Michigan students. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That we have a team there that's uh, forming in an incubator, and they've agreed to be part of Limitless Solutions, and which is essentially our nonprofit that is going to do this for free for families. Um, so we'll have to, we'll have yeah. to talk more uh, hearing <laughs> yeah. from there. Yeah. Um, and so that's the goal is that they're going to specialize in one type of research and development. We're going to specialize in a different sector, but we're going to come together. And the example is uh, there's a nonprofit in Syria right now who needs 75 arms like this for children as fast as they can get them because so many kids were caught in barrel bombs from the Assad regime or just caught in the humanitarian crisis that is the state of Syria right now. Um, and so uh, it's really hard for, for John and I to be, you know, international arms dealers. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> the NSA has a field day with us because, like, I'm getting emails from Syria and Saudi Arabia asking for arms for children. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm flagged, but they know. Um, but, but together, if I have, you know, 20 universities in the United States, and I say, hey, can you each build three arms? And in a week or two, we can send all of these to your country, or Cambodia for legs is what they need for the landmines, um, or just any type of disaster. The next earthquake or major disaster, we're hoping to be ready. And so that is going to take this modular collaboration of what we see as the academic system finally going to be giving back to their communities. It's kind of gotten inflated lately where the academics have just like raked in cash from their communities. and. Now we have a real chance of being able to inject that back in. And, and to the point, to the point of uh, it being something that can be worked on in hacker spaces, you know, the, the first the first iteration of the Limitless Arm is is a, is available online, including the Arduino code, correct? Yeah. yeah. So all, all everything that makes the the, yeah, the guide. yeah the first generation work, along with how to guide, etc. They put it up on there, so so that a hacker space could you know oh, cool let's and they did. yeah yeah and, and, and they are doing it yeah. So that's that's something. It's something that can take place, you know, in the university space. Um, that the power of individuals in their garages and, and tinkers is, is is a huge resource. So, you know, I got into three D printing and everything uh, in in my garage. Uh, you know, just uh, because I got an email from some guy in South Africa that had cut off his fingers and saw my special effects prompts and was like, hey, let's uh, let's build something together. Um, so you know, in, in a previous time. I think global communications, low-cost global communications is playing a role here as well. Because in a previous era, me and some guy, some person from 10,000 miles apart would have never been able to find that we had a common uh, set of skills that could be used for a project. So, and John and I spent the last nine months with me being in Germany yeah. <laughs> and him being the project lead in Orlando and us meeting almost every day would never have been possible before that. So yeah, communication has definitely empowered science. And now that science and medicine are talking to each other, we have a real chance of being able to uh, engineer. Right, and, and like the papers that, that you publish are about, are you more easier to share? No, no, yeah, I would actually say, so yeah, in terms of like myoelectric control, um, that's pretty much all in the literature. Like, so there's, there's, a, there's a few things that are sort of patented and proprietary, but mostly it's, you know, there, it, because there hasn't been anything that's been at best like commercial success, you know, because it's sort of a small market, um, most of it is in the literature. So these papers are really, really hard to read. Um, but if you want to know, you know, exactly what was done for the state of the art prosthetic control, you can get through the paper, and it's all in there. Um, so like I can, I can recommend a couple of papers then. Um, and actually, it's sort of everything, you know, it, it's fairly basic stuff. Like people are, are always impressed with the algorithms, but they're pretty straightforward. Um, they're things like. Processing. Yeah, it's, it's, so most of the work is on like the front end, the front end signal and cleaning it up. 
Um, and then there's just sort of simple classifications or regressions, and like it's all stuff that can be done on an Arduino. And so, and the other thing I was saying is, even if you if you like open up the iLim and see what's inside, it's not fundamentally a fifty thousand dollar arm. It's just that you know because they can only sell in the hundreds or thousands, um, that that's sort of what they have to charge to keep themselves in business right now, unfortunately. But if they're if it sort of took off, and there was you know there's three hundred thousand people in the U.S. that are missing uh, some part of the upper limb, and so. And they're still injection molding their parts. That's a big part of it. If you're okay. if you're building a hundred or something yeah. and you're using injection molding, you still have to pay the twenty thousand dollar fee to set up each tool, yeah. die, each die for the injection molding. Yeah. So uh, that's a cost. There was a, yeah. a cost. there was a question in the back. It was Nick, I think. Yeah. Um, so I was just saying, um, I you mentioned doing legs. So are you guys working on being able to do the same kind of home three? Yes. Right? But the legs are extremely much more complicated. Because yeah, they're I, was, load I, was I have a friend who um, has a walks on a pair of artificial legs. Right. So I mean, in now. history, we've seen peg legs. In a lot of third world countries or developing world, they use um, just blocks of plastic that they kind of shape towards the look of a foot. Oh. Um, to really have something with a little bit of degrees of freedom yeah. is going to take a miracle. And there are now carbon fiber printers. And we're looking at those, and or even fiberglass, um, as well as EMG with strong servos. And now that everything's getting smaller, I think the real hero here is like Arduino, right? Has empowered so much. That's that's awesome because I know uh, you told me how much this costs, and uh, yeah, you know, that's a pretty big deal. So. We're we're hoping in the next year to have a prototype that might work one day. We'll see. Um, particularly for legs, but also for arms. I'm wondering. Um, doing for stump fitting? I know it's really critical for legs, not quite so much for arms, but... Uh... So half of this is on the medical side of how they do the amputations. So the, the oral procedure is, mm -hmm. is, the, is the primary one. And I'm not involved with this project. It kind of just happened that I did a project on this with some simulation. And we looked at it and we, they found out that you know this is on the doctor's side when they do the procedures. If they do it well, you can have a huge improvement in quality of life. And if you don't, it's really dangerous. I don't know if you have more to follow up on that. So I was going to say, so the, it's, it's a really hard problem because skin is fundamentally not supposed to be really load bearing. You know, your bones are supposed to be load bearing. Um, and so, you know, again, the, the state of the art, to my knowledge, there, something that's a little bit scary, it's called osseo integration. Um, and it's where you can actually uh, put a titanium bolt in the end of the bone and have it going perpetually through the skin. And they, they make the surface such that the skin grows up fairly well. And you know, they have pictures of people swimming with them, people really like it, you know, but it's, it's just scary in the US. It, it has not been approved by the FDA because everybody's terrified there's gonna be a major infection of some sort. But if they could get that to work, that is just better. It's just better to have it attached to the bone. Right. And, so. and then, How do they normally uh, it's just skin comes over it, and then the skin gets. If you're in the case of the leg, the skin pushes down continually, and you can get sores. Um, so they just put a layer of skin. Over skin. Right. They do. Yeah. So they just put a layer of skin over the stump. Yep. It's yeah. a, it's important to note that for for the kids that most of these have. Um, so why why uh, why it actually had an amputation? But a lot of the children that are receiving these they, these printed devices uh, were uh, it's a congenital limb loss, so they were born without fingers or without a portion of their arm, uh, which is a very different scenario from um, an amputation because uh, they, they, they they typically have better better full better, better protected bone structures because they happened in your in utero, which we had no idea there was such a need for that yeah. until it started showing up in our inboxes. That the CDC estimates there's 150,000 kids born each year in the U.S. alone with uh, some sort of upper limb deficiency, and if you multiply that out, so kids under the age of 10, there's like a million and a half kids who are born with upper limb deficiency in some regard, which I didn't know. I had met one or two, and then when you start getting the emails, you say, okay, well, this is definitely something where you know, we can help with that. Uh, but I think that's why it's never been really done before, is because there wasn't enough people for it to be, to be a critical mass for a pharmaceutical company to say, we can make a billion dollars off this project. And it really is going to take innovators and education um, systems, I think, in order to not need to make a profit and still want to do something with compassion. So. Yeah, can you tell me a little bit about the surface treatment for the titanium, as well as 
about it, state of the art for interfacing with NERF bundles. Like, are we beyond NEA, or is it still like wrapping NERF or jamming a bunch of electrodes into it? Well, so uh, so I don't know much about the uh, surface treatment of osseointegration. Um, I'll talk a lot about 